This is uh, Sam Robson. It is March 23rd, 2017, and I have the pleasure of sitting here with Ambassador John Hoover at the U.S. Embassy in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, I'm interviewing Ambassador Hoover today about uh, the Ebola response that happened in this country uh, for our CDC Ebola Response Oral History Project, David J. Sensor CDC Museum. Uh, Ambassador, thank you so much for joining me for this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and could we just start out, uh, this is kind of silly, but would you mind saying my name is and then just pronouncing your full name? Sure, sure. Uh, my name is John Hoover. Uh, I'm the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Sierra Leone. Perfect. And, and if you were to summarize your part in the Ebola response as, as ambassador very briefly, like in a couple sentences, what would you say? I think it was uh, my principal role was really to sort of um, make sure we were coordinated because we had uh, the largest ever CDC overseas deployment, I think, in the history of the agency. So we had 100 CDC responders here on the ground on any given day for about a year and a half, uh, much bigger than our mission, actually. But we also had USAID emergency responders. And just, I think, my job and the job of the DCM was to kind of make sure everyone was working together and then also making sure we were working well together with the other international players and the government of Sierra Leone. And, and I think my other role was also to sort of be pushing and lobbying back in Washington to get the resources that we needed to fight the war here. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, backing up for just a second, if, sure. you, if you don't mind, uh, would you mind telling me when and where you were born? Uh, sure. I was born uh, in, in Boston, Massachusetts in February 1960. Thank you. Did you grow up in Massachusetts? I did. I grew up in a little town outside of Boston called Acton. Acton. What, what was that like? It was, um, it was a great place to grow up. It was a small town. Um, this was the 1960s and 1970s, which is before your time, Sam. But that was a time in our history where I think kids had probably too much freedom. We had plenty of freedom. We had good schools. We had uh, great sports programs. So it was just a great time and place to grow up. Hmm. Uh, what do you mean by too much freedom? Um, I just think back in those days, uh, it was probably coming out of the 60s and the 70s. The 70s were probably the most permissive decade for our society. And, and our parents were not helicopter parents. They sort of gave us a lot of, a lot of slack and latitude. So we, you know, as, as, as adolescents, sometimes we had a little bit too much freedom, I think. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. I hear you. What, what did your parents do? Uh, my dad uh, was a children's dentist. And my mom did a couple of different things. She was a social worker for a while, then she worked for one of the big tech companies in Massachusetts. Gotcha. So can I ask what kinds of things interested you when you were growing up? Mostly sports, um, baseball and ice hockey. Mm -hmm. uh, and did you always know that you wanted to go to college? What, what were your aspirations like upon graduating from sure, high school? Sure, sure. No, I think in, you know, in the setting that I grew up in, there was an expectation that everyone wanted to try to go to college. So. So that was definitely, uh, that was the goal coming out of high school was to get into a good college, hopefully be able to play ice hockey there, uh, and then beyond that, um, I didn't have that many um, longer term visions beyond that. So did that happen? Did you go to college and play ice hockey? I did. I did. I went to Princeton University and played a little bit of ice hockey. Gotcha. What, what did you study? Uh, politics. What specifically uh, drew your attention? Um, I think it was a course I took my, at the end of my freshman year. It was an international relations course. Uh, the professor was fantastic. And I just got real interested in international relations. And so that, that kind of converted into my, I, I was a, it was a degree in politics, but with a kind of an emphasis on, on international politics. Gotcha. Uh, so what happened after college? Um, I wanted to travel and live outside the U.S. It did, really didn't matter where. So I went to Japan, Tokyo, Japan, as, a, as an English teacher at a Japanese high school for a couple of years. Wow. How did you find that? Uh, I found it through my university. They had a program that placed teachers mostly in small schools all over Asia, all over the Far East. How was the experience for you? It was, it was fantastic. I never really, I'd spent a little bit of time in the UK when I was in college, but this was my first time to really live overseas. And I spent, you know, my entire childhood growing up in one house in one town. So it was just, uh, it was mind blowing. And Japanese culture is really unique. Uh, but but accessible and and friendly and safe and so I, I had a great time making new friends and seeing seeing another part of the world. Right on. Uh, so what happened after that? So after that, I went back to the U.S. and wasn't sure what I wanted to do career-wise. I was interested in the foreign service, so I took the foreign service exam. Um, but in the meantime, I ended up in New York City getting a job uh, with a big U.S. investment bank. 
And how about after that? Um, I, I did that for a year in New York, and then I did, they, they transferred me back to Tokyo, to the, the branch of the bank in Tokyo, so I worked there for two years. And it was about at that time when <coughs> the process through which you joined the Foreign Service kind of came to a head. And so when I left the bank, um, I was able to, uh, to come into the State Department and join the Foreign Service. And do you remember what year that was? Uh, 1988. 1988. Yeah. Uh, so you joined the Foreign Service. What do you do then? Um, well, I joined the Foreign Service. I swore into the Foreign Service on a Friday in 1988. And the next Saturday, I got married to my current wife. And so my life changed quite radically there, going from a single banker to a married you know, Foreign Service officer. <laughs> um, and then, you know, you, you, you go where the career takes you, I guess. We ended up going to Paris for our first uh, assignment. It's a short assignment because it was our first, and we had uh, our first son there. So it was, uh, it, was the, it was the beginning of what's been a very interesting and rewarding career. Wow. Um, if you were to look back over your career, just in general, in Foreign Service, what are, what are some of the places that really made an impact you right. on, on you, like, Every single place we've been uh, made a big impact on me in, in different ways, but almost, almost all in positive ways. We were in Shanghai, China for four years when our kids were kind of at that middle school age, uh, so they were still somewhat under control. And uh, it was just a really exciting time to be in China. It was the early 2000s when China was trying to kind of join the world community and join the World Trade Organization, and there was just a huge amount of economic development and growth. I mean, just literally in six months, you could see major changes to, to the city. And it was, uh, so we were there when 9-11 um, when struck. Um, and a couple of months after 9-11, uh, China was hosting the APEC summit. So President Bush, was, it was his first major um, overseas trip after 9-11. And so he came and stayed for several days. So it was, it was uh, really an interesting and and thrilling uh, time for us, but all of our, all of our assignments have been really great. We've yeah. had we've got great memories from from everywhere. Wow. Was there anything in your previous experience that was anything like a big outbreak? A little bit, actually. Um, when we were in Shanghai, I think it was 2003, I want to say, but it could have been 2004. I believe it was 2003. Um, there was a major outbreak of SARS in China, in in Hong Kong, but especially in China and and in Beijing. Um, Shanghai at that time was a city of 20 million people. Um, as we sort of realized that SARS was going to be the first major epidemic of the century, people thought there must be cases in Shanghai, and there were. We, there were but there were single-digit numbers of cases where they were getting dozens of cases in Beijing. So we were there kind of trying to manage uh, f the fears of people in our community um, and the U.S. business community. Um, people were just just couldn't believe that there were only six or seven cases in all of Shanghai, but as it turned out, that was the case. So it's just managing, managing fears, um, trying to make people comfortable so that they didn't panic. And um, we had an American citizen who was one of the victims, so we were keeping tabs on him as well. Uh, so I had a little bit of experience with with uh, nothing, nothing like Ebola, nothing like Ebola, but it was it was also a little bit scary. Sure. Had, had, I don't know if you worked with CDC at all during that time? Or? Um, so the WHO sent a team down to Shanghai from Beijing, and I think seconded to that team were, were some CDC folks. Um, who's the fellow with, he's Japanese-American. Um, Fujisawa? I can't remember his last name. KG, I think people call him KG. Oh, KG. Um, Fu He's in the WHO now. Yeah, right? he's yeah. back to WHO. So he was he was seconded to the WHO team that came down, and and they sort of randomly went through the hospitals in Shanghai to see if if the government was hiding cases basically, and they found that they weren't. So right. KG Fukuda, is that? That's it. Yeah. KG Fukuda. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, wow. Uh, so was is Sierra Leone your first ambassadorial post? Yes, or? it is. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. Uh, when did you become ambassador here? Um, I was nominated by President Obama in July 2013, so I should have come in, in, in 2013, later in the year, but I got delayed by uh, the tussle in the Senate over nominations, so I didn't arrive here until October 1st, 2014. October, oh wow. So, so nominated in 2013, I didn't get here until more than a year after that, like a year and a half after that. So, oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, what was it like then watching the Ebola um, epidemic start throughout the region and, and start to um, catch fire in the country where you're gonna, you were going to serve as ambassador. Right, right. 
I was, uh, you know, as I was waiting to come out here, um, I wasn't assigned. So I was working the Ebola issue in Washington at the State Department. So I was watching it very, very closely uh, here, obviously, in, in Liberia. Liberia had the, had the earlier spike in cases, so Liberia was kind of the focus of attention. Uh, by the time I got here in October, um, that the spike had come here, and we were just getting, we were getting four, five, six hundred new cases per week, which was just uh, mind-blowing, actually, and, and a little bit scary. So I sort of knew what I was getting into when I came out because I had been tracking the issue and, and helping at the State Department to manage it. Um, so, uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, a scary moment, you know, scary moment for everyone. Can you tell me about moving out here? Um, it was kind of a blur, waiting, waiting, waiting for the Senate to confirm me. Uh, when they finally did confirm me, I moved as quickly as I could to get out here, to, to swear in and, 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 and move out here. I could not come with my wife because we were under evacuation for dependents. Um, and so it was a real quick, fast, just get on the plane with some suitcases kind of, uh, kind of arrival. Gotcha. Well, can you kind of just take it from there? What, what happens then when you get in country? So when I, when I got here, with regard to the Ebola um, outbreak and the epidemic, uh, it, like I said, it was sort of running away from us. It was accelerating away from us. And so it was, it was a really scary moment. I was, I was struck initially by the lack of coordination. It wasn't clear who was in charge of the response. Obviously, the government was in charge, but which part of the government? Was it the Ministry of Health? Uh, what, were the, what were the roles of, uh, of international partners like the UK, the WHO, ourselves? Uh, that wasn't very clear. Uh, there were structures in place, but just in terms of making the hard decisions and making those really fast decisions that you have to make in a crisis situation, wasn't really happening. And so um, that was my first impression. Again, not a really positive impression, but things got better from there. Wow. Yeah, can you just continue? Sure, sure. Um, so we were all late in, in figuring out what this thing was and how serious it was. We, meaning the US government, US CDC, the State Department, the National Security Council, the President, we all kind of thought it would go away. In fact, that summer, the, 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 the number of cases kind of subsided and everyone sort of said, oh, it's over now. Um, so it took a while, it was about in that time frame, September, October, that everyone said, holy cow, we've got a major, major uh, epidemic here that could spread well beyond West Africa. So um, it, it was, once I think people had that realization, they started to bring resources to the table, including the U.S. government through CDC, also through USAID's Office for Foreign Disaster oh, Assistance, yeah. OFTA, mm -hmm. USAID OFTA came in um, initially with a small a uh, bit of money, but then a lot more. Uh, and so it was just about that time, October, November, that um, with this thing running away from us in Sierra Leone, that CDC, I believe in November, put out a, a public analysis which said basically if we don't do anything about this in the region, we're going to have 1.4 million cases of Ebola by January. So that, that kind of scared people. And that encouraged people to, again, bring resources to the table. And, and it was at that time that the government made a, a decision to set up a National Ebola Response Center, the NERC, with help from the UK and from us also, from USCDC. Um, and that, that created command and control. So that issue of coordination and not knowing who was in charge sort of went away. And the NERC kind of took control of the situation, again, with a lot of help and resources from partners. Um, but that they started to get a grip on, uh, on, on controlling the epidemic and eventually beating it back. And then they opened district level emergency operations centers as well, the so-called DIRCs, um, the one that was here in Western and which uh, Dr. Frieden visited at least once, if not twice. Extremely effective, extremely well organized, sort of met that sort of military style command and control, which was, was so necessary to, to sort of start to bring the numbers down. And so by all the other pieces that were lacking came together. There was a lack of ETUs of, of, of beds, of Ebola treatment units. Um, there was not enough lab capacity. There were issues with ambulances. There was, you know, there, there wasn't an emergency call system. All those things kind of came together in that time frame, October, November. So that by by early January, we saw that very steep curve, which was accelerating up away from us, started to break and, and crash the other way. So that was sort of the big, the first big sigh of relief was sort of January when that curve just broke and started, and the number of new cases started to to decline sharply. Mm -hmm. Do you remember uh, who, who are some people who you worked with most closely 
uh, from like October to December in those earlier months? Yeah, initially uh, CDC had sort of 30 day rotating country directors or, you know, guy who was in charge. I knew some of those guys because I sort of bumped into them in other parts of Africa. So it was great working with them, but there was sort of a, a little bit of a lack of continuity. And I think it was November, I'm not sure, that, that uh, CDC sent out Oliver Morgan to be the country director. And so he was here for, I, I'm not sure how long, but close to a year, I think. I'm not sure. Um, so, you know, we all became, you know, fellow soldiers in the war against Ebola. Um, it was a great experience uh, working with, with him and with all of his team. Uh, often it was a rotating team, but sometimes this, the same people would come back again and again. So. So good, uh, good relationships. Also uh, on the USAID OFTA side, we had two or three people who rotated and took, took turns coming out to Sierra Leone, so we had good continuity there. So it, it came together very nicely. Uh, as an interagency U.S. government team, we came together really well. I was really you know, proud to be part of that. And we also did the same with our other partners, like the U.K. and the government. There was a, there was a very strong sense of, of unity of purpose and that we're all in this together. And uh, so that was... For me, that's the strongest positive lasting memory I'll have of the Ebola crisis was what people are capable of doing when they, when they work together. Yeah. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Absolutely. I wouldn't want to have to do it again, but I'm glad I did it. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. Um, this is kind of a strange question, but uh, <clears throat> I, I've spent like several hours with uh, Oliver Morgan interviewing him, uh, very enjoyable for me. Would you, mind, would you mind describing him from your own vantage point? Uh, sure. Um, Oliver's a great teammate. He's a, he's a, he's a great person. He's uh, got a nice personality. He's kind of soft smoking, but super smart. Uh, great sense of humor. Um, and, you know, that's what you need when you're in a crisis. You need someone who is calm and has perspective and even has a little bit of a sense of humor. Uh, and, and he just, he did a great job. He worked really hard in, in managing uh, CDC's uh, effort and in, in keeping, you know, your headquarters up to speed and, and, and making sure they had what they needed. And I know it was, uh, it was just huge pressure on him, and, and I know he was very stressed out, but again, he sort of kept, kept his cool. And uh, yeah, we're friends, it. yeah. We're awesome. Um, now, I, I know things came together pretty well, um, as you said, mm -hmm. uh, with all the U.S. government agencies. Um, but uh, I figure in such a chaotic environment, there were probably some bumps on the road. Do you, do you remember a any of those that you were able to, to try and uh, smooth over uh, between U.S. government agencies like CDC or, uh, and USAID and I don't know? Actually, I think uh, on our interagency team, um, we had really good working relations with everyone. Everyone saw themselves as being part of one team. So that I never had to officiate between different agencies here um, at our mission. Uh, the State Department presence is, is a permanent presence, and we, you know, we were the logistical management platform to to support the emergency responders from USAID and from CDC. Um, our Depar Department of Defense here uh, pitched in; and they they got a lab, procured a lab which was used in the response. Everyone worked together very well. We, we occasionally had friction with other international partners. Um, you know, that, that occasionally happened. Um, uh, the UK, for example, would sometimes see trends a little bit differently than CDC would see trends, and so there'd be some, some friction over that, and I would, I, I would sometimes have to smooth those feathers a little bit. Do you, do you remember a specific example of that? Um, I believe, let me think about this. Yeah, I think it was. It, I think it was around um, that that November time frame, 2014, when again CDC came out with with what some people thought was an alarmist estimate about the number of new cases by January. So that that was kind of it was kind of around that. Oliver was very serious. He was uh, you know super smart, very serious, uh, very concerned about about the numbers and. Um, I think the, the the UK side wanted to play it down a little bit because. They were sort of the lead international partner, and they didn't want people to panic. And so there was a little bit of a, a, of a, of a disagreement of a scientific nature over how bad the situation was. Yeah, makes sense. But, um, you know, we just, you, just, you just step in and, hey, guys, everyone's on the same side here. Let's just work it out and talk to each other. So in the end, as I said, our relationships with everyone, uh, the relationships were fantastic. Can, can I ask what your like day-to-day -day life was uh, like back then in the in yeah. the heat of the thing? 
Yeah, it was all a bull all the time, pretty much. And because of the time difference with uh, the East Coast of the U.S., we were working every night. I had, I have my work computer, I have a version of that at home, so I would work here, leave on time, but then go home and end up working late into the night, sort of answering a million emails from, from people in Washington. So that's, as I said earlier, that was kind of my, one of my roles was to sort of manage Washington a little bit so that we could focus here on what we had to do. Can, can you talk more about that, that role of um, advocating for resources here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said, initially, um, well, as you know, the, the, the U.S. government response in Liberia was, was massive. I mean, we literally sent, what, a, a brigade of, 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 of Army folks in to help build Ebola treatment units, and CDC had a big presence there as well, as did uh, USAID. Uh, the response uh, here, the U.S. government response, was, was smaller, um, even though really the epidemic was just probably more severe here in the end than it was in, in Liberia. So I realized, as I said, when I got here and I wasn't clear who was in charge, who was going to do what, that there were going to be gaps in, in, you know, resource gaps in the overall response. And that the U.K., although it had the lead and had pledged uh, to, to do most of the effort, wasn't going to be able to do it by itself. So. We had visits from USAID uh, administrator at the time, Raj Shah, and then we had a visit by um, our U.S. UN ambassador, Samantha Power, and and I think we were instrumental in, in getting getting her to come. She initially, I think, was just going to go to Liberia, um, and they saw firsthand that we didn't, no one really had it under control here, and so 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 having them come and see that, talking to them, have them speak to the experts here. Uh, the stuff that we wrote and sent back, I think, helped sway uh, Washington uh, to give us more resources, which they did. We got a massive increase in our, uh, in our off the budget. I think CDC was already in, in here in a pretty big way, but it definitely helped uh, so that we could get resources that OFTA could very quickly use to, to fund burial teams or to f they funded a couple of bullet treatment units. Um, wherever there were gaps, um, they could sort of step in quickly and fill them in coordination with the UK and the, and, and the host government. Now, at that time, was funding for global health security generally, like, still in the conversation, or was that about to come up? Um, you know, the global health security agenda had been sort of in the making before Ebola, and I think maybe it's a good thing. If, if there's a positive thing, Ebola has sort of accelerated all that, and so we're working on that now. So I'm not exactly sure what, what pots of which of the CDC budget the, the money came to do this work here, but um, the CDC did just great work, really great work. Oh, thank you. Um, you talked about uh, like S Samantha Power coming and getting some firsthand experience, really learning how awful it was on right. the ground here. Yeah. Do you have some of those experiences of your own, of, of witnessing something or something where the experience really hit home? I think, I think it was one on one of Dr. Frieden's trip. I think it was the first trip he made when I got here. I think he came in August before I arrived, and then he came again at some point there, I think before Christmas, uh, when things were still pretty tough. And we went, we did a, did a lot of different things on, his, on his, uh, his program, but we went to King Tom Cemetery, and that was, that was, yeah, that was brutal. Um, you know, hundreds of people milling around outside, you know, with their loved ones being buried. Um, burial teams bringing in bodies uh, in, the, in the white body bags. You couldn't even walk, you could barely walk between the graves because there was just no room. And just, just marked with these little crude wooden crosses. And uh, we were standing there with Dr. Frieden and Oliver. I've got a picture of it. And you can kind of see one of these little, these little tiny wooden uh, crosses on a grave. And then there was, a tr there was an ambulance there and they were pulling, they were pulling a body out of, the back of the back, out of the back of the truck. And the, and the guys were spraying and it was, it was like apocalypse, you know? Yeah. It was awful. Yeah. And then talking to survivors also is, is it just it brings you to tears every time when you these young people who lost their parents and their siblings and their aunts and their uncles because they're all in the same house and somehow they survived um, that that Samantha Power did that and I think that really moved her it, it, anyone who was sitting in the room was moved um, so that's that's also um, a memory yeah thank you that I won't lose. Yeah. Um, were you able to uh, do any coordination with the uh, embassies of the other countries where Ebola was really? We, we stayed in regular touch. I you know, was emailing with my counterparts in Guinea and in Liberia pretty regularly. Yeah. Um, 
you know, we had the, the, the epidemics were slightly different in each country and the timing was different as they kind of came and went. Guinea was, was, was more unique, I think, than the other two country, other, other two of us. Um, but, um, yeah, we stayed in regular touch. It was more, more just sort of um, moral support, I guess, you know? So, makes sense. Uh, can you tell me about uh, kind of the end of the outbreak uh, and how that was for you? Yeah, it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, it, it was a long time coming. As I said, we sort of broke the back of the epidemic in January. But we didn't, we didn't have zero cases until November, um, November 7th, uh, 2015. So I remember that day. Um, what do you remember from the day? So that, that summer um, of 2015, just it, not a large number of cases, but we still had to kind of keep our eye on the ball. So it was, it was and we'd have already, I'd already been through a year of this. So it was just, it was fatigue. I think it was a feeling of just emotional fatigue. And it was, we had to, we, the U.S., CDC, we had to make sure that other actors and players, especially in the government, didn't just sort of stop and, and uh, make sure they stay engaged, stayed engaged until they got to zero and beyond zero, actually, because then we had a couple of more cases uh, even into January 2016. So, so by the time we got to November 7th, um, and, and they had this big ceremony down, uh, down in Aberdeen at the big conference hall, and the president was there, and... Um, for me, I was just exhausted. That's that was that's the only. I mean, relieved, but but just exhausted. It was, is I guess it's sort of like almost like a form of you know of, of post traumatic stress disorder or something like that. It's just I was really tired, um, but happy that it was over. When you when you look back, how do you think your experience with the Ebola epidemic here in Sierra Leone changed you, or or as a, as a person, or or changed how you approach your work? Right. Um, I, think, I think it made everyone who, who went through it and worked through it more resilient, it made, made us stronger because um, it, was, it was extremely stressful and, and difficult. But um, I'm more appreciative, I think, of, of you know, having, you know, having comrades, having colleagues that, that, that you could work with and depend on. That, that was a wonderful thing. So, yeah, it's, it's, it definitely made me smarter when it comes to uh, viruses and, and epidemics. I learned a lot, um, unfortunately. But uh, as I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it again. I wouldn't want to go through it again. I wouldn't want other people to have to go through it. But I'm, I'm, ha having done it, I wouldn't trade it in for anything um, because of the, f the friendships made, the, the bonds of, uh, of, of trust and friendship with, uh, with all the people who came out and did this. Gotcha. Uh, you know, I just realized I, I should have asked, who, who among the uh, officials in the Sierra Leonean government did you have the most contact with? Was it President Karoma or was it? Not so much the president. Um, we, we dealt a lot with the fellow who's the director of the NERC, uh, Paulo Conte, who had been previously the Minister of Defense and who, when I first arrived, and literally the first week I arrived in Sierra Leone, I, I went to go on a run with a group of guys who were running. I didn't even know who they were. And Paulo was one of these guys who was in the running group. So I met him just kind of accidentally um, in a social way, and we sort of became friends. He's a, he's a nice guy, and, and uh, again, he brought that military perspective uh, in the way he directed the NERC. And so he was always at the NERC, and we were often at the NERC at briefings and, and things. So he was the one guy we, and he had a whole team of folks who, who we worked closely with, um, and the CDC uh, folks worked closely with. So. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know you'd really defined your role as kind of organizing the U.S. response and, and then uh, asking Washington for resources. Was, was there any, like, diplomacy that was involved with you, with, with the Sierra Leonean officials, when it, came, when it came to, I don't know, some policy issues or how to tackle this thing? Right. No, I mean, I think we were all pretty much on the same page. And I think when there were um, instances of disagreement about some aspect of the response between the government and the other partners, the international partners, I think it got worked out kind of at a working level. And this eventually turned into the, the, the key role that the UN played. The, uh, the head of UNMIR here was, uh, I thought, very good. And she, she was kind of a broker between the government and the other international partners whenever there were issues, um, where there was disagreement or or, or, or or people were irritated with one or the other. So, so that, that was... I didn't have to do that so much because we had the UN, that was their role. I hear that, I hear that. Um, so thank you, thank you again, Ambassador. Um, my I think pleasure. My, I think my last question for you is, 
Is there anything that I haven't asked about, that we haven't talked about, a, a reflection or a memory that you have of Ebola that you'd like to share for the historical record? I think I'd just like to say thank you to Dr. Frieden and everyone at, at the Centers for Disease Control. As I said, this was the largest ever overseas deployment by CDC, and I've worked with CDC in other countries and always had a lot of respect and admiration for, for their work, but, but the work they did here was truly, truly heroic and, and, and vi obviously vitally important. We had several cases of Ebola in our own country, so we know this could have gotten out of control. And without CDC here, not that CDC could have done it all by itself, but it was absolutely a, a vital component of, uh, of the response. So. Dr. Frieden's uh, personal commitment to, to ending the Ebola outbreak and his three trips here um, and the leadership he showed, his, his communication to, to publics, to the public here and also to the government, I think were, were really, really important. And um, we should all, all Americans as well as Sierra Leone, should, should thank him and his CDC team. Okay. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hoover. Really My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you.